Hi, I'm Christopher Ray, and welcome to the second of three video lectures about Yuha's novel, Brothers. This is a novel in which we follow a trickster through the Cultural Revolution and also through the Economic Revolution of Reform-era China. And so I want to focus on Baldi Li as a figure, as well as some of the other rather tricky, slippery figures that we find in this novel, and ask, what do these figures do? Put another way, why are we following a trickster figure through these two different eras? Why would Yuhua choose a trickster figure as the main character in his novel? What is his agenda here? To answer this question, I think we first need to take a look at some ideas about tricksters. These are mythical figures who are often very smooth talking, or they don't have a lot of physical resources, but they make their own world out of language. Baldi Lee does some very interesting things with language. He also turns himself from being this kind of juvenile scamp into a tycoon who presides over all of Liu Town. I think that one of the things that Yuhua is doing is mimicking in fictional form the rise of the hero entrepreneur figure, but he's also travesting that figure at the same time. And we could just look at one real world example if we take Scraps Lee as he's reinvented himself and look at the queen of trash, someone who made her fortune based on the lowest of the low by taking things that nobody wanted and turning it into something immensely valuable. There's a very interesting moment in part two when Wandering Zhou appears. He's introduced as a figure of the rivers and lakes, the Jianghu, who is a consummate swindler or con artist. Wandering Zhou plays an important role in the plot, particularly in the plot of the two brothers. He takes Song Gang away from Liu Town, away from his wife Lin Hong, away from his brother Baldi Li, and when Song Gang comes back and discovers that his wife is gone, he kills himself. Wandering Zhou, however, lives on, and I think that he's very interesting both as a contrast to the successful trickster Baldi Li, whereas Wandering Zhou is a failed swindler, and that he ends up being domesticated into Liu Town. Finally, I want to talk about Yu Hua himself as something of a trickster author, because he adopts a lot of the techniques of the trickster, that mythic figure, in constantly and repeatedly defying our expectations. Brothers represents both the revolutionary era and the reform era as ones that are ripe for and rife with trickery. And I would say that trickery doesn't necessarily equate with deception, because a lot of it is perpetrated in plain sight. There's a lot of bald-faced trickery going on here. However, you could say that there's a lot of self-deception attendant on this trickery. In oral cultures and literary cultures around the world, trickster figures are outcasts. They are figures of the threshold or the margins. They are partly inside the house, partly outside the house. They typically don't have any material resources of their own. They don't have status or power or money. They don't necessarily have a home to call their own. And so they have to rely on their wits and often their glib tongue in order to succeed. So they end up being, as a result, very creative, even ingenious, very clever, sometimes deceptive. And they tend to be mythic, and that these are figures that are not just bound by one historical era. They keep coming back in different guises again and again. Tricksters are world-making figures. They don't just make a life for themselves. They also kind of aestheticize experience in very profound ways. And Lewis Hyde puts it very well in saying that Trickster starts out hungry, but before long he is master of the type of creative deception that has long been a prerequisite of art. You think of figures like Monkey in The Journey to the West. Baldi Lee, for all of part one of Brothers, is perpetually hungry. In telling and retelling his proprietary story, he uses empty words to fill his belly, with one bowl after another bowl of house special noodles. So he turns the intangible storytelling into something that is very tangible, food. Tricksters are double-dealing figures who both harm and help other people. And they themselves are also both triumphant and suffering, in Lewis Hyde's words. Blacksmith Tong is the last one in Liu Town to acknowledge Baldi Li as the King of Butts, a title that's both lofty and degraded at the same time. Later on, Baldi Li takes this moment of acute suffering, this very abject moment when Li Lan is going out to visit her dead husband's grave. And Baldi Li devises for her with his own resourcefulness and ingenuity this remarkable, luxurious, exclusive use pull cart. So he turns this moment of suffering into a rather triumphant one, at least symbolically. So we can see how Baldi Lee commoditizes storytelling. He has one good story, he resells it multiple times, he has a monopoly over this product, and he even has some repeat business and people who forget the story and keep coming back. He also has a you-get-what-you-pay-for ethic. If you don't pay him in full, he won't tell you the story in full. But if you do pay in full, he will not hold back. Of course, you could say that there is a scapegoat to this type of profiteering, particularly in Lin Hong, who has been humiliated throughout all of Part 1. She is excluded from this value chain. 
Tricksters are boundary crossing figures. They span different times, places, and eras. They also span different modes of kind of the vulgar and the sublime. So I think Baldi Lee is a figure who's very adaptable to this type of shift. He is a very versatile figure, and that is one of his many functions within this novel. His prowess as a storyteller is established in the opening chapters with the story of Lin Holm's butt, but he also does other type of playing with language. For example, the grand opening of his salvage and recycling company, he adapts all of these revolutionary slogans in a very mawkish way. He turns the lofty and high-minded public serving into something much more self-serving. Within this novel, he is a very entrepreneurial type of trickster, who again, never holds back if you pay him in full. He's also quite reasonable, so although he rejects writer Liu's first description of himself and poet Zhao, when writer Liu comes back with a revised version that he thinks makes sense, he says, that's more like it. Baldi Lee ups his game and starts transforming himself from a scamp into a tycoon through scrap metal. So he accumulates all this scrap metal, and he does so at a very interesting place, right outside the government building. So this is something of a political protest, but it's also one that is really a get-rich-quick scheme. In 2005, people reading about Baldi Lee's scrap metal exploits may think of this woman. Zhang Yin made a fortune in collecting and reselling what other people consider to be mere garbage. And Baldi Lee does a very similar thing as Scraps Lee. Zhang Yin was later described as the richest self-made woman in the world. And that self-made is quite important. This is not someone who got her wealth through ill-gotten gains or government graft, or simply inherited it from her parents. This is someone who made her fortune through entrepreneurial zeal, resourcefulness, and talent. Brothers is responding to a phenomenon well known in China and around the world of the CEO puffery of these flattering portraits of business leaders who are meant to be inspiration to us all. For example, CEO Shou Xi Zhi Xing Zhang, a film by Wu Tianming that is about the triumphant rise of the CEO of Hair, a Chinese conglomerate that has taken on the world. And these narratives don't just flatter the CEOs and business people, they also flatter the officials who have the foresight, the wisdom, and are willing to devote resources to support these enterprises that are going to make China great. You can also look back decades to before the People's Republic of China, where it's very commonplace for there to be like who's who in China, where you have biographical and autobiographical puffery of the leaders of modern China. So Yuha has this wonderful farcical treatment of this notion that we're all CEOs now. Like In reform era China, even the most dim-witted and passive person can't help but be elevated. So this, of course, includes the two cripples, three idiots, four blind men, and five deaf men of the Good Works factory, as well as writer Liu and poet Zhao. Some critics consider Baldi Li to be something of a folk hero, a Min Jian Ying Xiong. I've also talked in another video lecture about how he's something of an IQ like figure. Ah Kyu, as I mentioned in the other video lecture, is a suffering, bullying, self-defeating figure who is also something of a societal scapegoat. And I think that we could apply that in part to Baldi Lee. That image that we get in the very first paragraph of the novel is not a reality, it is Baldi Lee's fantasy. Another trickster-related way that Brothers has been interpreted by critics is as a carnivalesque work. And actually the author himself has endorsed carnivalesque readings of Brothers. So carnival is a finite annual time period preceding Lent in the Christian tradition, and during which societal rules are suspended. And when Lent comes, then you have to give up meat. So carnivale, you say goodbye to the meat with a last feast. And so carnival celebrates symbolic inversions, excesses, and particularly bodily indulgences. One of the most influential studies of how the carnivalesque manifests in literature is the Russian critic Mikhail Bakhtin's study of Francois Rabelais. Bakhtin talks about Rabelais' work as being one that is presenting an image of the world in the carnival. We even have contemporaneous representations as the jester as encompassing the world. The carnivals is a fool's world. The figure who presides over carnival is the lord of misrule. This is someone who goes from being the lowest of the low to the highest of the high, and oversees all of this jollity. The lord of misrule is something of a jester or fool figure, someone who is granted comic license during this finite period. The jester or fool at court is something of an everyday carnival figure, Someone who is wisecracking, someone who is commenting on the action, someone who is burlesquing or parodying it, who is violating all the taboos, who is saying all those things that respectable members of court can't say. And they disguise truth as folly, so they're often thought of as being truth-telling figures, but ones who oscillate between truth-telling and sheer nonsense. And of course, if they push things too far, they can become a scapegoat. They might end up punished. The carnivalesque reading of Brothers is very inspiring, but I also believe that it's incomplete. 
and that we have a carnival that doesn't seem to really end. Baldi Lee is still at large at the end of this novel, and we also have multiple carnivals repeating themselves. We have a revolutionary carnival, and then we have a reform era carnival. There's also another element that Yuhua inserts, which is the rivers and lakes, which comes from a very different tradition, and I think we would have to incorporate into any carnivalesque reading of this novel. The Jianghu Pianze Zhou Yo, or the itinerant charlatan wandering Zhou, appears relatively late in the novel. And I think that whereas Baldi Li's habitus, his kind of primal energy, is very closely connected to Liu Town, yes, he does travel to Japan, he goes to Shanghai, he goes to other places, but his real life force is connected to Liu Town. But Zhou Yo, we don't know exactly where he's from, and he travels all around. I would consider him to be a reform era iteration of a very old trope of someone who is on the road all the time, always looking for the next opportunity, and very, very deceptive. When Wandering Zhou drags Song Gang down to the south, Song Gang ends up something of a scapegoat of the reform era. He is crucified on its cross of petty entrepreneurism. And it's not an accident that they go south instead of north or west, that the south is China's land of economic opportunity as defined by Deng Xiaoping in the late 70s and early 80s. This is where it all began in terms of China's economic growth. So the Rivers and Lakes is a very old imaginary that has had many different iterations. It is a realm of travel, of commerce, adventure, and deception. The Rivers and Lakes is this place away from home and hearth that people will retreat to. It can be a refuge. It can also be a place that they go to in search of opportunity, a place to strike it rich. And it's a place that is populated by these different itinerant figures, these peddlers, performers, warriors, medicine men, monks and swindlers. These are all stock tropes that we find in Chinese performing arts, oral storytelling, fiction, and film. Most familiar to readers and viewers nowadays is the wuxia, or the martial chivalry version of the wandering swords people who go through the realm, but they are marginalized figures. They are perhaps outlaws or people who have committed a crime. So they're not fully in the embrace of the metropole or the capital. They often have a tenuous relationship with official China. The more relevant figure here, I think, is the medicine man, the Jianghu Lang Zhong, who travels around from locality to locality, peddling dubious medicines, and who knows what medicine is in that gorge. A wandering charlatan will sell you anything that you're willing to buy. If you want domestic, we've got domestic. If you want foreign, we've got foreign. One of Yuhua's innovations here regarding the Jianghu trope as he has this rivers and lakes figure, this itinerant wanderer, settle down. He goes from being wandering Zhou to wanderless Zhou. So Yu Hua is a very clever writer. He's someone who slips in these inside jokes, so you have to know a little bit about his background, that Yu Hua used to be a dentist, or at least a tooth puller. Yu Hua is positioning himself as something of a lord of misrule in the realm of storytelling. He keeps inverting or defying our expectations. He parodies and travesties things that are so familiar to us. He plays with language, all of these set phrases and buzzwords. He baits us with things that are patently offensive. And I'd say that ultimately, he is somewhat evasive, but he is persistently so. And it is the persistence of this world making that for me confirms that Yu Hua is acting as something of a trickster, and that to the very last page, the surprises keep coming.